I have to start off with Omicron. How much does this new variant really uh, confuse the outlook when it comes to what was looking like a very robust recovery? Yeah, uh, good morning. Yeah, look, it is obviously a concern for everybody, but um, from New Zealand's perspective, you know, we've got a very robust system of managing COVID. Um, we have had our first case caught in our managed isolation and quarantine facilities uh, here in New Zealand, and, and they continue to provide very important protection for us. But in terms of the way that we've put together the government accounts, you know, we're aware that this is a global pandemic that is not finished. And the good news is that New Zealand has been extremely resilient economically right throughout the last two years. Obviously, we've had a quarter uh, in the September quarter where we had some lockdown restrictions. Uh, but as you note, we we're already seeing a rebound from that in the December quarter and, and forecast through into early next year. So while it's disruptive and it's deeply concerning from a health perspective, we remain confident that the New Zealand economy will be resilient. To put into context, of course, that 3.7% contraction we had this week was better than expected. It was it was good news, but it's still, you know, pre-pandemic, pre-Delta levels. Do you still expect to see a V-shaped recovery or does this new variant really muddy the waters on what that forecast is going to be? I think forecastings and predictions have been more challenged than ever through the COVID period. New Zealand yeah. certainly did see that kind of V-shaped recovery out of the first uh, wave of COVID. And I remain optimistic about our ability to bounce back. But as you note, you know, we are a, we're an open trading nation in New Zealand and we're affected by what happens everywhere else in the world. And so, you know, the large scale spread of Omicron around countries that we're seeing at the moment has the potential to have that ripple effect uh, through to New Zealand. Uh, but every, all the indicators we've had so far is that is that people are learning to deal with COVID within our business sector. Uh, they know that they will come through the other side of it. And obviously we've continued to provide a, a, a large degree of economic support to get us through this most recent wave. Could a fallout of Omicron that you mentioned also involve the government delaying the reopening of borders in 2022? Well, at this stage, we're sticking to the plans we have. We have a progressive reopening of our of our border and a reduction of those restrictions beginning in January for New Zealanders returning and then by the end of March for other others coming into New Zealand. Obviously, we will continue to monitor uh, the spread of Omicron and its severity as well. Uh, but for now, we are sticking to uh, the, the decisions that we've made. We've got some reviews set in place, uh, one of them in early January before we begin that process. The government has assumed more workers will be coming into the country because of the reopenings. Are you at all concerned that perhaps New Zealanders may be leaving the country as well in order to search for better pay? Well, look, obviously, you know, um, as borders and restrictions uh, open up all over the world, there will be opportunities for people. Uh, one of the things that's been heartening from uh, this period of time is that we've seen unemployment in New Zealand fall to around 3.4%. Uh, we have seen more New Zealanders going into work, and we've invested significantly in training and skills enhancement programs to be able to support that. So we'll continue to do that. Um, and obviously, there is the opportunity for more inward migration. We've already had critical work areas covered off through this process, but we will be working with sectors in the economy to make sure we meet the skill needs that they have. Um, actually, of course, it's the sign of a robust economy that we have these skill gaps, but we're conscious of the fact that we need to work both in New Zealand and in terms of inward migration to meet them. The biggest challenge for so many policymakers, including at the RBNZ, has been rising inflation. In fact, CPI inflation headed towards 6%, and a lot of it for New Zealand is actually domestically generated. Are you concerned by this at all? Are you confident that the RBNZ can get a handle on inflation without crimping growth? Well, obviously, in the forecast that the Treasury put out this week, they see uh, inflation peaking in the first quarter of 2022 and then coming off from there and heading back towards the Reserve Bank's target band of, of 1% to 3%. Uh, a lot of the inflation that we are seeing is driven by those global considerations, though. You know, we, we've got um, higher oil prices, albeit that some of those have been coming off lately, uh, but also supply chain disruptions. And for New Zealand, being where we are geographically in the world, uh, we are affected by that thing 
things like building materials and so on. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to manage our way through that, but um, the forecasts are that we are near to the peak of that inflation and it will start to come off. Clearly, the Reserve Bank have, um, you know, their trajectory that they've already announced around interest rates. But we do have to remember we are at historically extremely low levels and we've, we're up at 0.75 now. Um, if you took us back a few years, that would be seen as a very low level. At the same time, the government is planning significant fiscal spending for the budget in 2022. Doesn't that create a harder job for the RBNZ? Is this the right time to potentially stoke further inflation with a big fiscal impulse? Well, we don't believe that the spending that we're proposing from, from the middle of next year onwards will have that kind of inflationary effect. It's particularly focused around uh, uh, an overhaul of our health system. Uh, a lot of that involves dealing with deficits that have already been built up in the health system, and then that expenditure is to set up a, a new nationwide health service. Alongside that, there's some spending around our investment in emissions reductions. Many of those programs will go over a number of years. But I take the philosophy that when you've got long-term challenges in your economy and society, such as dealing with climate change or, or an overhaul of the health system. Um, you can't afford to, to be bogged down by a single quarter's numbers. We will be responsible with our spending. We've shown that over the course of the time we've been in government, but we mustn't walk away from big long-term issues. I would note that, you know, the, the government expenses as a percentage of GDP are at about 35% now in response to COVID. But across that four-year forecast period, they return to around... 30% of GDP consistently. So while there's some increased spending, uh, I think it's in the right areas, and I think it still maintains a good fiscal balance. So does the government have a target in terms of potentially domestically generated inflation through uh, all of the spending, through construction costs, rents, as opposed to, say, imported inflation? And what is the target balance there? Well, that's a matter for the Reserve Bank. The, the agreement that I signed with the Reserve Bank governor is to be between 1% and 3% over the medium term. They look closely at the balance between tradables and non-tradables, uh, and that's part of their thinking in terms of the way they make their decisions on interest rates. But uh, as, a, as a government, we don't set that. We obviously are acutely aware that, you know, inflationary pressures that are in the economy can lead to cost of living increases. We've got a, a role to play in supporting particularly our lower income people through that. But overall, the Reserve Bank has the job of getting back to that 1% to 3% target over the medium term. And the forecasts that we saw this week do do that. I'm asking you to put your hat on as Deputy Prime Minister now and talk about the what some have criticised as mixed messaging when it comes to New Zealand's stance for the Beijing Winter Olympics. Should the government have gone one step further in confirming a full diplomatic boycott? Well, we already let uh, the Chinese government know in October that we wouldn't be sending ministerial representation. Uh, there was a range of reasons for that. Um, a big one among them was actually just the logistics of COVID. But New Zealand has consistently raised our concerns about human rights issues in China. And in fact, in the conversations where the Prime Minister was letting uh, President Xi know that we wouldn't be sending ministers was also a conversation where she raised human rights concerns. So from our perspective, we had already taken our decision when, when others came forward with theirs. Uh, you can be sure that New Zealand will continue to raise the concerns we have about human rights with China within the context of a, of a wider diplomatic and economic relationship that we've got. Is that where the confusion lies, though? Because in October, President, uh, Prime Minister Ardern did raise Xinjiang and human rights abuses in that conversation, and yet it seems the, the, the narrative around why uh, officials won't be attending from New Zealand when it comes to the Winter Olympics has been overarching COVID-related restrictions. Is that the right messaging and the right emphasis to take? Well, there's a mix of reasons for why we're not going, but I think the most important thing here is that where we do have concerns about human rights issues, we raise them. And New Zealand has done that consistently, not just with China, but with other countries as well. Uh, and so the Beijing uh, Winter Olympics is one matter, but for New Zealand, it's actually more for us about being consistent over a period of time about what we do about those concerns. Um, like all countries in the world, we have, a, we have different um, levels of our relationship with China. Uh, we value that relationship as we do with other countries, but we have to have a mature and robust relationship that means we can raise the concerns we've got. We'll do that consistently, uh, and we'll, I'm sure the Chinese government are clear about our views in that regard. Is Australia's relationship with China a cautionary tale in terms of perhaps New Zealand not wanting to strain 
their relationship with Beijing when it comes to influence uh, over this, this area? Well, New Zealand, certainly since the 1980s, has been very proud of our independent foreign policy stance. We understand that different countries have different types of relationships with one another. But from New Zealand's perspective, we'll always set out to do what we believe is best for New Zealand and what we believe is best for the world. And that will mean that we will take stances um, that are, are appropriate for us. As I say, you know, we value our relationship with China. We work closely with Australia. Um, they're all part of an important network of countries in the Pacific and Indo-Pacific, along with the United States and others, who, who need to work together. And, and that's our commitment. We believe in multilateralism. We believe in strong regional cooperation. And we'll do that from New Zealand's perspective. So we don't judge other countries for the way in which they undertake those relationships. But we will continue to be robust in our advocacy on the world stage for the things that we believe in.